Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. And first off, I want to say thank you to everyone that joined us yesterday for another episode of our bi-monthly show, Beyond the Red Zone. Uh, it was another great episode with Marcus and Mac that uh, I was in tears by the end of the episode. Uh, my face hurt laughing so hard, uh, considering I had done three other shows uh, before that yesterday. I was prepared to just turn everything on and let those guys go, but we just got into it and it was a good time. So uh, definitely for the leftist sports fans out there, uh, Beyond the Red Zone every other Monday with uh, Mac from You Don't Know History Pod and Marcus of the Left Flank Vets. It's always a good time. Very, very interactive chat as well. Also, uh, check out my interview with Doug Lane for Sublation Media. Uh, also, an article is coming out that will be working in conjunction with the video essay that will be dropping tomorrow at 6 p.m. Welcome to the Terror Dome. Looking at the L.A. riots. Anyway, let's bring in my homie, my dog. He is the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. It's been a while since I've seen you folks. I had to take a little hiatus. Things got a little hot and heavy during Ramadan. A lot of pressure for the show and fasting. Took me a bit under the weather for a few days, but I'm feeling much better now, still under recovery. Thank you to my good co-host, Jason Miles, for handling the uh, ship while I was away. But uh, I'm here to uh, slowly ease my way back with you. That's a double. That's a double. That's a double welcome back. I wish there was more of a. I wish I had like a little scene of a of a standing ovation or something right now to play. But it's uh it's fun to see you back on the screen. You know, as people of course don't know, we've been speaking this entire time. Um, so I have seen you on screens. I mean, we even spoke this morning. <laughs> Yes, we did. <laughs> but uh, I'm I'm excited. You know, there's going to be some writing coming out from Pascal Robert sooner than later. A lot of writing, a lot of writing. And by the way, if you guys don't see me on the screen in the next week or so, it's because I'm probably having to do some writings because I've got a lot of articles that I've got to put out that I owe quite a few people. Not that I owe them because, like, they got money on me or anything, but because I really have got to uh, put more literary work out. For those of you who have been so invested in the show, many of you don't know that when I was doing my online work for most of the last decade, I was pretty much just a writer. And it wasn't until really 2017 that I started to enter into the podcast space. So it's, it's almost ironic how things have turned around where I'm known more as a commentator and podcaster, but my long kind of dossier of, as of writing has not really has been has not really been as investigated by my, some of my fans who know me more for my uh, audio work. Well, I'm excited to see uh, some more writing. As I don't even want to talk about it just yet, but. I, I think if you write a rebuttal or or maybe even a critique of this uh, of this book, that's going to be big, man. I understand. I understand. Like that's why I got it so quick for you. <laughs> when you were like, "Can you give me this book?" I was like, "Oh, I'll get you that book." <laughs> Someone Archie joking, Roberts says, is just a writer. I'm her. RC, I know you're a great writer as well. I didn't. I shouldn't say just a writer. I was trying to be, you know more humble than I guess it needed to be. But you've been a fan of my work for a long time also. Um, Pascal, do you also see the uh, animated uh, Adolf Reed that I have on the screen that's moving? I do. Adolf Reed from like 1982. (laughs) 
I always like to throw the throwback Adolf on there. Uh, Gene Bajlan said, Jason, why do you uh, have Adolf looking away like that? He said, you know, you can flip the picture where, you know, you can turn him around. I was like, well, I wanted him to look away like, man, I ain't tripping off you motherfuckers. <laughs> I was like, it's a perfect, it's a perfect picture. But before we bring in our guest, I actually made an intro clip for the show that I'm pretty excited about because I've been thinking about making this for a while, and I was like, look, I got to make this clip before we do the show. So let's get into that real quick before we bring in our esteemed guest. years. She's done it for corporations and universities across the country. It's the blue-eyed, brown-eyed experience, or blue-eyed, green-eyed experiment, where you have... Explain the experiment, Jane, please. You separate groups according to eye color, and you place those who have the wrong color eyes in the position in which we place minority group members and women in this society, and gays, and people with disabilities. And most of the people that I work with are white, so-called adult males. And those blue-eyed, white males, when they are placed in the situation in which they are treated the way women and people of color are treated in this country react exactly the way women and people of color react in this country. They get angry. Angry. I have been threatened with death numerous times. I've been hit by a white male during this exercise. I've had a knife pulled on me. And these are all white males who say they wouldn't have a problem if it happened to them. And they can't understand. They can't understand Los Angeles because they don't know why those people are so angry. Is anti-racism a leftist politics? Or is it a clientist politics that is the antithesis of being anti-capitalist? If race and capitalism is forever intertwined, is this ideology one of solidarity building or more radical liberal bourgeoisie politics trying to present itself as something more? Has diversity and inclusion and implicit bias training helped close a racial divide? We'll ask these questions and more. This is Revolution. Well, sir, not to state the obvious, but you yourself are black, African-American. I mean, isn't the KKK opposed to your race? See, I knew you were going to try that. You haven't been listening to me, son. This is the new claim, okay? Let me show you something. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget. All right, without any further ado, let's bring in our guest. We don't need to rattle off the man's resume. He's been on the show. I think he's been on the show more times than anybody else. Maybe maybe the only person who's been on the show more times than him is either Asatar Bear or his son. <laughs> I can't think who's been on more. Please welcome Adolf Reed. Well, uh, so here's the moment we've all been waiting for. Is the microphone working? Uh, it's 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 fine. <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? Really? It's, it's on. We can hear you, man. We can hear you. Deep, but it's it's it, we'll have to deal with it. It's fine. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on, but because um, yeah, I did. Don't worry about it. You in New Orleans right now, right? Yeah, I did a Zoom panel uh, you know, this morning, and everything was fine. But it, it was the same setup. So, uh, But anyway, sorry. I hope uh, the sound quality isn't too impressive. So that photo, by the way, is from a demo in Chicago, I think in 1997, maybe. Uh, it was uh, um, the Sony strike, uh, and, and uh, we were out in front of a, a movie theater uh, in, in – and, and the solidarity with Ayatsi, right? Uh, but anyway, neither here nor there. Good to see you guys. How you doing, Matt? Doing all right, man. Doing all right. How are the book sales going for the South? Well, I don't know. Uh, like I look at the Amazon 
uh, totals every now and then. Uh, my publicist says he's going to try to get some info from, uh, yeah, from, the, from, 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 from production, I guess. But uh, I know the first run sold out in a couple months, so I'm we'll see. Uh, that's all right. That's all. That's a good. That's a very, very good thing to hear. Yeah. Well, listen, Adolf, we uh, brought you on a show to talk about your latest piece in Nonsight, which I love the title. I love the article. Because Let me go and get up. my big can, white can man, I, the Quantalist Foundation. I, I do want to say this. I do want to say this before you ask the, the question. So I had I had just got done doing the show, and I was not in the best of moods for an entire uh, day. Okay. And I was driving a, a lady friend of mine back across the border to the airport in San Diego. And we, um, you know, you got to leave super early, uh -huh. like three in the morning to beat the border traffic. It's horrible. Oh, oh, yeah, right. And uh -huh. so we go across and, and she goes, you know, because I, I, lo I love Denny's when I go home. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have one here. She goes, well, take, you know, I'll take you to Denny's or whatever. Uh -huh. And as we're there, I'm I'm finally reading your 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 article. Okay. And uh, I was so pissed because I was like, God damn it! I wish I would have read this the day. Because <laughs> points I was trying to make, I was like, ah, I was I was I was I was so mad, and I sent to Ray a message right. I was like, damn, I'm just now reading this thing. Oh, so, you told uh, me that's why I emailed you actually. Yeah, and I was, I was, I was, when I saw that, uh, I told Pascal too. I said, well, when we bring you back on the show, Pascal, I definitely want to make it, make sure it's a show that you're comfortable with, and everyone's going to be excited about. So, uh, I know Pascal is going to be excited about this piece because once I sent it to him, I knew, I knew he was going to devour it. So, I will move out of the way now. Right. So, again, so the title of the piece: Let me go get my big white man, the clientelist foundation of contemporary anti-racist politics. Now, Adolf, I've been reading you long enough to understand what exactly you're talking about when you're referring to this politics. But for anyone who is familiar with your repertoire of writing over the years, they will learn that there is a kind of read lexicon of terminology that kind of develops. Not that it's played out, but mm -hmm. it's in the arsenal. And one of my favorite words that is in the uh, read arsenal that is used is uh, taxonomy. Oh, okay. You know, taxonomy uh, as a classification of a subject. Mm -hmm. So the question I want to ask you is that, and I and I and I, and I really like you to to make this clear because I think this is the crux of the problem. Do you acknowledge that what you have been challenging in your writing and this current piece about anti-racism is distinct from the long anti-discrimination efforts that have existed in America, perhaps from inception? Making that distinction is crucial in my view, because the reason I, I think it's important to make that distinction is that when you tell people that we're fighting anti-racism, most lay people are like, well, why? Why would you want to fight anti-racism? Because they think anti-racism is basically the movement to fight against racial discrimination. And what I realize is that one of the reasons they do that is they don't realize that anti-racism not only is distinct from anti-discrimination, Oftentimes, it has nothing to do right. with anti-discrimination. Can you right. make that clarification of taxonomy for our audience, please? Sure. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to address something in the chat. No, there's no relaxer. I just need a damn haircut. But um, um, so, I, well, I guess in the first place, I don't, yeah, I don't really talk to lay people about anti-racism, right? Uh, I mean, I talk, well, I talk to working people about uh, you know, issues that concern them on a daily basis, right? And what I found, by and large, is when I do that, like the question of where I stand uh, about anti-racist politics or, you know, uh, Joanne Reed or Black Lives Matter or whatever doesn't even come up because as 
you brothers both know, and I assume much of it, much if not most of your audience knows, those aren't the issues that you know rank and file black people think about as they go about their daily work. I mean, like um, I was on a panel uh, just about a year ago with a brother who was running for Congress in Brooklyn, who was who was going on about how um, he didn't. Uh, I think I mentioned this in the article uh, uh, about he didn't. Um, accept the idea that there are class distinctions among black Americans because every black American faces like a, a daily danger of being killed by the police. Well, that first of all, that's not even true statistically, but wait, wait, he said, he said every black American is in danger of getting killed by the police. Right. Right. Uh, and that's why he said there's no such thing as class distinctions among black people, right? He wouldn't accept that, that idea. Uh, so, I mean, uh, but um, so, no, I mean, I've never been opposed to anti-discrimination politics. I think I've always made that very clear. Uh, I've never been opposed to affirmative action as a as as, as an um, as a technique of um, more extensive Anti, anti discrimination enforcement, right? Um, but, but yeah, what's called anti racist politics at this point is 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 something that's entirely different, right? It, it's uh, actually what what Cedric and Ture referred to uh, more uh, recently as 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 black politics as as it's understood contemporary in the contemporary times. It's it's a class driven project that's um, 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 advanced by elites and wannabe elites uh, who uh, purport to speak in the interest of a generic racial constituency with which they have no direct and organic connection other than what they claim <clears throat> by, uh, by virtue, <coughs> pardon me, by virtue of race and they propound an agenda that doesn't have that that doesn't directly address the everyday felt concerns of the vast majority of black people in this country who either get out to go to work every day or are expected to go to work every day. You know, it's really interesting. One of the terms I've used to describe the discourse around this politics, particularly in the same period that you're talking about in this piece from 2015. Is, is why I use, I use the term racial grievance discourse. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I wrote a piece for Black Agenda Report yeah. uh, called The Great Awakening, which I didn't coin that phrase. I mean, I think you might have been the person to coin it, but it started somewhere else and that I basically talked off, about like, how. Uh, uh, um, um, I think I know the jerk off who first coined it. It might have been Matt, Matt Iglesias, but. Right. Oof. But I wasn't thinking about him when I used it either. It just came to me. Right. But, but the, the basic premise of the piece was how racial grievance discourse had been increased in its weaponization in the era of the late term of the Obama presidency right around the uh, the, the coming 2016 election. Right. And I want to get to that uh, in terms of the confluence of events around that later on down the line. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I really admire about the piece that you wrote here in Nonsight that we're talking about, and we're going to repeat the title again when we shared it. Let me go get my big white man, the clientist, clientelist foundations of contemporary anti-racist politics, is that you discuss a history that, as someone who's re re familiar with your repertoire, uh, I've read in several of your pieces, articles, books, what have you, but I never get tired of hearing because it is so absolutely uh, oblivious to discussion within the hallowed halls of Black studies, yeah. within the hallowed halls of all of Black academia who claim to wax rhapsodic on their specialization and knowledge of right. Black political history. And that particular historical narrative that I'm talking about is the way in which race relations, and the race leader or racial manager or racial broker, if you will, comes to be. And just to let you know that 
I tell you, jokingly, I read your stuff. But when I read your stuff, I buy the stuff that you suggest that we read. This uh, is the education yeah. of Booker T. Washington, Michael yeah. Rudolph West. Yeah. Right here. Look, yeah. Very good book. Yep. Yeah. Very good book. And um, can you go into for our audience? And you know, you don't have to prolong it as much as you need to, but can you go into where the concept of this race leadership, race management, race relations, or I, or I like to say racial ventriloquist paradigm comes from? Um, I want to challenge you a little bit because I, I kind of think it might be even a little earlier than Booker T. And I'd like your thoughts on that. Okay, well, yeah. Uh I mean, Booker T is like the symbolic uh, avatar of it, right? But um, so look, um, until emancipation, uh, and uh, Michael West makes ma ma you know, makes this argument. Um, you know, until emancipation, uh, the the substance of the Negro question was really a question about slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Once slavery was over, we had a 30 year period thereabouts when the Negro question wasn't really on the table anymore, or the Negro question was, if anything, more a matter of how black free people were going to be in incorporated into American life, right, into the mainstream of American life. And that's what the 14th and 15th Amendments, right, were set out to do. And also the 13th, no matter what Ava DuVernay and whoever she talks to in the crack house believes. Um, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were all it, um, focused on navigating the incorporation of Black Americans into um, a, 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 a post of the insurrection or a fully national citizenship that was anchored to, you know, to free labor ideology. Um, and over the course of that 30 year period, in, in, in the South where the vast majority of the black population was, you know, there was like on, you know, ongoing struggle, right? I mean, free people wanted to be as far away from slavery as they could get. Um, the, the planter class wanted black people to be as close to slavery as they could manage. Uh, among other things, the share crop system kind of came out of that as a compromise. It was still tilted to favor the planters, of course, but 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 at least it freed the free people from direct supervision of white overlords. Uh, and all through this period, you know, uh, you know, after the ratification of the 15th Amendment, for sure, you know, black people were voting, holding office, right, um, uh, from, you know, from state level to county and town level. And for all that period, you know, the idea of a Negro spokesman or a Negro leader just didn't exist, right? There wasn't a job description for such a person. And there didn't need to be, and moreover, couldn't be, right? Because black people were civically engaged, right, on a regular basis. So one irony is that it's only in the context of, of, of expanding disfranchisement, uh, disfranchisement in the 1880s and 1890s that, um, that the notion of a Negro leader began to take take shape, right? Or a Negro leader as a category or a job description. And what's so smart about uh, Michael West's book is that he points out that Washington, not as a theorist of something called race relations or of black leadership, but through his actual practice, substantively it invented the notion of race relations because what what happens what happened was that um black people disappeared and this was a natural um effect of disfranchisement and the expulsion of black people out of civic life especially in the south black people disappeared as individual citizens right and they disappeared as you know students, teachers, doctors, lawyers, plumbers, shipbuilders, right, carpenters, farmers, preachers, anything. And we're all compressed into the racial identity, right? That that singular construct 
of the Negro, right? And the race relations framework took shape as a way to accommodate really Northern liberals more than anybody else to the reality that, that in the South, the 15th Amendment was a dead letter. The 14th Amendment was basically a dead letter. And the 13th Amendment was an open question, right? Um, and, and what replaced, but what made it possible to, to overlook the expulsion of black citizens from civic and public life in, in the South was this idea of race relations. Because what happens is, is that in the race relations framework, the thing that matters is how the races are, or how the races relate, right? Uh, well, and there's no way to know how the races relate unless you've got a broker or a mediator um, fastening the loyalty of the subordinate race to the agendas of the superordinate race, right? Um, and, um, um, and in that framework, then there's only like you know, good race relations and bad race relations. And what good race relations means meant is that nobody who mattered was complaining, which meant white people weren't complaining, powerful white people weren't, weren't, uh, uh, weren't complaining. This, bad, this is an uh -huh. There's an important element here that I don't know if it's out of humility or out of, I've said it enough, I don't have to explain. There's a, there's a very important fact that we're missing here that explains why was it necessary? And we did a whole show on this. Why was it necessary for the American ruling class to disenfranchise black people within 30 years of emancipation? And yeah. what caused that to happen? And what that caused that to happen is that black people and white people mm -hmm. were basically engaged in one of the most powerful and most radical labor uprisings, particularly in the South, Right. that had the, the chance to not only threaten the traditional function of Southern plantation capitalism, but fracture the hegemony of the two-party system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it could have been. I, I mean, like, it's easy to exaggerate um, the extent of the threat, right? I mean, for a long time, for instance, I, you know, I thought that... Um, that the Southern, uh, the ruling class was like crazy, right? Because the threat couldn't have been that great. But in fact, it was, right? Um, and, and it's one of those cases where, um, well, I think I said this, I don't know if I said this in that article or someplace else, but, but if we think about how people like Jeff Bezos and um, Elon Musk, um, they respond to the demand that they pay taxes, right? And they treat that like it's a threat to put them under a forced march to, to Jablinka. Um, well, but it helps to sense a little bit that how powerful people with absolute power feel any challenge to the absoluteness of their power as though it's like a cannibalistic uh, uh, on an uprising. Uh, but, but it's certainly the case that, um, well, look, um, so a, a populist Republican fusion government won statewide in North Carolina in 1894 and was reelected again by an even wider margin in 1896. So uh, the readjuster movement took power in, in the Virginia in 1879 and, and less dramatically along the way uh, from the time that blacks had been in, in, enfranchised you know, at the state and local level um, you know, alliances of black and white, uh, you know, working class people challenged more or less successfully or with varying degrees of success, like what I should say, um, planter, merchant, capitalist class power and, and, the, and success in putting down the populist uprising, right? Just basically gave the ruling class what a go ahead but to liquidate it all, right? And, and to impose um, you know, under the, the framework of white supremacy to 
to to impose their absolute dominance right over the politics and social life of the region. Um, you know, so, a yeah. super chat here is that we don't want we share with you, Adolf. We have a good friend, friend of ours, Strong McCallum, asked, "What does Dr. Reed think about the forced closure of Liberty Steel in Georgetown via zoning standards pushed by the South Carolina tourism industry?" Don't know if you're familiar with that, Adolf, at all. Oh yeah, well, I am. Uh, the former president of that local is a good friend of mine. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, and he's now president of Local 1422. Uh, which is the main local in Charleston and is president of the South Carolina AFL-CIO. Yeah, well, look, I mean, um, look, like those were, uh, I, I mean, longshore jobs, and that's one of the things you find as soon as you start to work uh, you know, down, down in the low country. It's also kind of true here, but the economy is more varied. But like in the Charleston area and near Georgetown, it's just up the coast a little bit. Um, about halfway between Myrtle Beach and, and Charleston, I guess, probably a little closer to Myrtle Beach. But anyway, um, you know, longshore jobs are very important and quite nicely remunerative jobs for black people yep. in, in coastal South Carolina. Um, but it's also kind of like the second season of The Wire, right? I mean, yeah. the money is in the redevelopment industry and the tourism, right? Um, and, and I mean, um, what I, I mean, I assume the person who, who asked, I mean, knows uh, what I mean, knows what's happening with the housing market in you know, low country South, what, in South Carolina, especially around Charleston, but all over, uh, what, I mean, down in the low country. So, I mean, I think it's one of those issues, though. See where, and see, this is one of the places. This this can be one of the places um, when, um, uh, um, or one one of uh, the the, the, the um, instances, I guess, in which um, uh, you know, the reflexive way we tend to think about you know, gentrification can you know, undermine our being able to make sense of what's uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, because while it's true that blacks will be black workers or blacks will be disproportionately by a, by a significant margin uh, um, counted among those who are displaced by closing of the Liberty uh, um, uh, plant. Um, the um, the Closing the plant isn't, or, or the point of closing the plant isn't to make black people unemployed, right? And that black people are likely as not to be in, involved in, in both the initiative that leads to the disclosing or, or to the closure, and 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 also to to uh, um, 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 uh, um, to to the tourist development that that you know, takes its place. Um, so yeah, it's horrible. Um, wow, that's just you. I'm really impressed that you were so in, well versed in the details of that. I would, that would have been the question. I'd be like, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even before the show, we were talking about uh, you know a person that's been working in in the advocate world for decades, and Adolf's going, Oh yeah, tell Randy I said hi. You know, he's. <laughs> you know, and then even this picture is like, oh, that was at the such and such strike. You never hear him talk about, you know, the panel he was on. It's no, I mean, that's one of the things I do appreciate about, you know, uh, about you as an academic, uh, a office that it's not simply, you know, ivory chair, ivory tower, smoking, you know, expensive tobacco in, in a pipe and having like, you know, nice, well branded uh, cognacs. You actually are a labor activist and have been for a long time. And I know you're kind of coy to really outline that as part of your history, but for many of those, particularly black academics who like to assail you that I run into all the time, they're like, I don't, I ain't seen it all in the prisons. That's maybe because he's trying to get those Negroes jobs when they get out. Man, he, that's what he's <laughs> never seen. Well, I, I, I do want to ask this question. Uh, oh, by the way, I have to point out that uh, May 6th was uh, Willie Mays' uh, 91st birthday. Really? I was going to leave you alone about that. 
And so if you guys don't know, Adolf is a bit of a sports fan, a, a more of a baseball fan. And he, I want him to publicly say that he knows now that the Denver Broncos are going to the Super Bowl because they <laughs> have the best black quarterback in the NFL and Russell and Russell Wilson. I got to give you props on that. Um, and, and it's possible. Uh, and, um, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I guess they're as good a bet, uh, you know, to lose to the Saints as anybody else. <laughs> well, I do, I do want to ask you, I was reading your piece and I, I was able to highlight some, some excerpts from it. The material and ideological project around which the emergent stratum of black putative race leaders took shape was, in Kenneth Warren's characterization, substitution of black professionals, managers, and intellectuals for their white counterparts within those institutions charged with administering to the needs of black populations, or, more succinctly, establishment of managerial authority over the nation's Negro problem. Now, we, we keep talking about this definitely in almost an ancient past when we talk about Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. And a big reason for me to want to do this show also was the emergence of a new idea. As anti-racism definitely took off, was it 2016 or so? I think that book came out. Ibrahim mm -hmm. X. Kennedy's book came out. And then before that, you had... Uh, uh, Robin D'Angelo De Kelly's uh, White Fragility. Um, now we have a more radical anti-racism right. in the elite capture right. of anti-racism, as if this ideal of being anti-racist um, is something radical. Well, Jason, and, you forgot something, because this is somebody who we, we've been neglecting who kicks this off that we didn't give enough credit for. And that's Tyler Hesey Coates. Coates. Yeah. He's he really, kicks it off, but I think he kicks it off with the whole reparations thing. And was that 2014 or 2012? He writes that piece, A Case for Reparations. Um, I want to say 2014 in response to reading The Color of Law right. um, by Richard Rothstein, who also was on this show. Um, but have you, I don't know if you've checked out any of these new, new books, because it's kind of the same song. But what do you say to this idea that anti-racism, intersectionality has been captured by elites? And actually, these are radical forms of thinking. What do you say to that? Well, I'll tell you what it makes me think of right away. Um, the debates around rap in the late 80s Ooh. and the early 90s, right? Ooh. So You're talking about with... Uh, Gerald Horn and uh, Stanley Crouch and well, all those. Well, I didn't read all them, man. Like, you talking about like Bill Clinton and Sister Soldier? No, 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 no. Are you well, talking about like uh, what's his name, Tracy Ellis Ross? What's his name? Not, not Tracy. We know. Uh, oh no, um, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Um, anyway, no, uh, no, no, but closer to inside the paradigm, right? Because so, <coughs> I figured that what was like in the source, right, and vibe. Oh, and yeah. Because uh, <coughs> I figured that 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 those people. Um, what, yeah, the academics that you mentioned, or Crouch, and and, uh, and folks like that knew less about it than I did. So there's no point reading them, right? But <laughs> but the way it went though was that yeah, okay. So there's the critique of misogyny and of homophobia that pops up from some people on the left of the hip hop world, and this I think was in the early cohorts of. PMC black people who are trying to figure out how to make a living off pimping this stuff, right? Uh, Say it um, again for the people in the back. Say it again for the people in the back. That's, that's real. That's what they did, right? Of but, course it is. I remember that generation well. So, like, they would explain uh, about how some of the stuff that you so heard about was sexist and misogynist and homophobic. But there's some dude way out at the ass end of Queens or farther out on Long Island, who was producing stuff that was played on a pirate station out in Long Island Sound mm -hmm. that was revolutionary, and that the other stuff was co-opting it, right? Um, and running alongside that, right, was this argument that um, um, 
that that um, the uh, well, the one without the left political um, aspirations was an argument that one, well, but there's some group out there that's like really authentic and hardcore and down, right? And then they become lionized for a little bit, and 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 the record label buys them a big house, uh, you know, whatever. And um, well, sorry, the record label buys a big house and lets them live in it. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, but uh, but then as they become popular, right, and 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 begin to realize what's every artist's dream of expanding market and crossing over, then they get denounced as sellouts, right? They're not authentic anymore. And they become the grist, right? Against which the next um, product in a development defines it itself as, the, as a truly authentic opposition and so on and so on and so on. And and for the totality of the time that I've heard this this line about the authentic radical voice coming up from the streets, that comparison has been in my head because it's just the same thing like in a different industrial context. So DeRay McKesson was like the authentic, you know, I don't know, Nat Turner of, 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 of the Black Lives Matter till he wasn't, right? Until his stuff just got so embarrassing that everybody had to admit it. And then, you know, the three women of Black Lives Matter, well. Well, well can, I, can I add this to, to, yeah. to kind of stir the pot up? I want to ask you guys how you feel about this because I'm, I'm, digging, I'm, I'm digging what you're throwing down. Um, when we talk about the music context, it's definitely easier for me to, <clears throat> to, to look at it. Right. And one thing that you're talking about in, as, as market capture is you always get the derivative, right? So when NWA hit, um, they were kind of a bit of a derivative of what had been happening with Ice-T when he hit. Yeah, right. And then you get all the derivatives of NWA where after you know three or four years, it's just how many people you can kill on a record, right? right. right. You're, you're the CNN of the streets. Right. And in the context of the DeRay McKessons. And then they bonded with David Duke and they turned it south. Oh, I mean, you know, these are young cats that are getting money and they just want to keep getting money and be right. controversial. Yeah, right. no, you no, know, no, they, no. Weren't, they weren't trying to be no. a voice of the people as much as they were trying to be controversial. And then we also have to keep in mind what voices they were hearing, like what was left over by the time those guys are, are coming up anyway. Yep. Um, and and when I think about that, you think about Black Lives Matter, you know, however people want to look at Black Lives Matter, uh, you're going to get a derivative of that because people are seeing them as grabbing a bit of a market share, mm -hmm. especially as everyone is looking at themselves as a product. Right. No, that's right. You, you know, it's really changed the way we look at activism in a way because yep. there are people on YouTube that are trying to be. Right professional activists, right. professional protesters. Right. And someone coming from an era before, and we've definitely talked about the the sixties and and you know issues within the sixties. I talk about it in the in the upcoming video essay that'll be preparing tomorrow at six. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but what is what is your take on, on stuff like that? Like do you think that right now we're seeing something maybe even more insidious than we see in the 60s because it's kind of ingrained in us because it's so part of the system in which we exist in that there's people that are just trying to capture different audiences. Like maybe I won't be Ibrahim X. Kendi. Right. But man, if I could get a quarter of that audience. Oh, no, that's right. Well, yeah, I mean, let me say two things. Um, and they're both kind of anecdotal, but I hope it's okay. Uh, the one is, um, so after Walter Scott was killed in North Charleston. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the brother who, 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 who a bystander videoed uh, the cop shooting at eight, eight times as he read, you know, as he ran away from the cop. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there, there's a young dude. I came across this uh, on YouTube, like a young brother who who was described in the video as the North Charleston, the 
chair or whatever of the North Charleston Black Lives Matter chapter. And he was obviously someplace in a parking lot with a few of his boys. And they were videoing him giving the glib talk. And he was doing the glib talk. And it was all just kind of, you know, it's kind of pathetic to be honest, right? But but transparent, or at least it was transparent to me. Uh, but, well, yeah, I'm not patting myself on the back. It was transparent to anybody who didn't want to believe in it, right? Um, so fast forward, like I forget what year Scott was killed, but fast fast forward to when um, it's 2016, and I was working in the Sanders campaign down there. And we had a big event at in uh, Columbia at the University of South Carolina with me and Cornell West and the president of the state fed and Nina Turner may have been there too, but they were like packed auditorium, a uh, uh, big bit, uh, but a real big event. And when it was over, a young brother who turned out to be this young brother from the video, uh, you know, went up to Cornell and was trying to pigeonhole Cornell about what the campaign was doing wrong and so forth and so on. So Cornell kind of passed him off to me, which 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 made sense because Cornell thought that I might have have had more you know s structural connections with the campaign when I'm in the state because he was more of an in and out guy, but I didn't really. But anyway, so the dude starts giving me the line about how. The Santa's campaign is messing up because it's not doing what it needs to do to reach out to young, young African American people, right? So, so I tried to be nice to him for a little while, and he wasn't hearing it. And, and, and the more I said stuff to him, like, you know, you should go, go to the office at Columbia or, or in, in Columbia and sign up to volunteer or whatever. Uh, you know, the more aggressive. He got, and it was clear what what I knew from the very beginning was that he was auditioning, or thought he he was auditioning to be the representative of the young African American voices. Word. He had the dreads, you know, like my boy down there. Yeah, the uni. Yeah, the uni on. Yeah. Yes. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> and, and my boy in Orangeburg, in South Carolina, asked me years ago, and I'm like, this is the brother. But what I've often said to him, like if there what was a Nobel Prize for apothems, he would have won for saying that the only thing that hasn't changed about black politics since 1965 is how we think about it. But uh, this brother asked me one day out of the blue, man, we, you know, we we, uh, you know, we may have been having a drink, but he said, like, have you ever known anybody with dreadlocks and good politics? And we thought about that. For a second. <laughs> <laughs> but. But anyway, so 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 the young blood is getting really pissy with me, right? And so I finally said to him, "Look, man, look, like I didn't appreciate this hustle when your granddaddy tried it on me, right? So like you know, right? I'm not going to appreciate it now. I know what you're doing, man, and like this isn't going to happen, right? Like right right right? Like you aren't going to get the job of of of, of embodying the voice of." African American youth, in, but in the Sanders campaign, or at least not if I have anything to say about it. All right, that's one, and the other one's a lot briefer. But it's like, and 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 I may have mentioned this one on this podcast one, once before too. But you know, right after um, Garza, Colors, and Tometi, mm -hmm. uh, it became the thing, right? And when the line was beginning, that we needed to recognize that this hashtag was created by three queer black black women. Mm -hmm. And I started waiting for somebody to tell me why we need to acknowledge that, right? And what that does for us, actually. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, creating the has hashtag becomes the same thing as creating the movement. And I've said to people, well, people don't, you know, individuals don't create movements, right? But I saw the three of them on a panel, and I can't attest, and, and, and it was on TV, uh, but uh, I, I guess it must have been like a YouTube thing. And, and I can't attest that it was all three of them, but I know at, at least Garza 
uh, sent a chill up my spine because Jason, she was enacting exactly what you said. It was clear that she, and by extension, they were absolutely incapable of making a distinction between or perceiving a, a, a millisecond of daylight between what advances, what advanced their material aspirations and careers and something that would build something called, called a movement. And that was like a chilling moment to me because I realized this had been going on, right? I've been dealing with young people now, you know, since the mid 1970s, mm -hmm. watching them cycle and decline basically. But, but, but that made clear to me that we had hit, hit a point now of neoliberal in, in incorporation of its opposition, basically, uh, such that it was now spawning its opposition, right? Uh, and, and while I could not have forecast how this was going to play out over the subsequent years and just how bad it was going to get, uh, but, but, but um, you probably noticed, uh, and others who like look at the piece may not go to this, uh, the footnotes or the massive footnotes. So I'll say this. There's a lot of footnotes, by the way. Huh? There's a lot of footnotes. Oh yeah, totally. But the but but in the first endnote, I point out because I actually was working on something else on a deadline, right? I was working for uh, well, I was working on a chapter of uh, for the book that Kenneth Warren and I are doing. And a buddy of mine who works for the Teamster local uh, or the UPS local in Philly, which is a good, solid, progressive local, sent me a link to an interview that Joanne Reed, who I uh, described as 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 MSNBC's Tribune of anti-racist neoliberalism, had done an interview with Buttigieg um, in the late late January of this year. You know, in which she flippantly and gratuitously, it had no connection with, with the subject of the interview at all, made a reference to the Infrastructure Bill Act as the White Guys Employment Act. And that just kind of what underscored the extent to which, A, in the first place, it's wrong, it's crazy, right? Because black and brown people get those jobs too. Mm -hmm. But it just you know, underscores, and like they've been saying since 2016, that if, well, to the extent to which people like Reed and others have been insisting that any reference to a working class is in fact a veiled reference to, uh, um, to, to, to curry favor with racist white people, then, 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 then the natural implication of that statement is that you can't be black and working class. Exactly. Which means that a working class agenda cannot apply to black people. And that's why what 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 we as black people get from them is is challenging the goddamn racial wealth gap, which exists for the umpteenth time only between the richest 10 percent of black people and the richest 10 percent of white people. Well, well, I feel like and I don't know if you guys feel the same way. A lot of that discourse and I know we're getting closer to the to the time limit and there's definitely some things i want to get into in the in the bonus half but i feel like that discourse really gets heated up amongst people that feel like maybe they're a little cheated in that like there's like an upper stratum of of uh black cats that, that kind of get into that discourse a little bit more like right. in doing my research on um, for my article and then for the video essay i didn't realize and maybe you know this adolf because you spent some time in california in the 90s by like 1990 la was home to more millionaires and had ever been home to before and there was quite a few black ones oh. but it also was home to the poorest black neighborhood at the same time in south central so well somebody if, up there in baldwin it, i think it was i think it was a reaction to the fact that number one there was an increasing encroachment of precarity economically in black spaces that was hitting not only lower working class blacks but even upper middle class blacks because of the subprime crisis, right? And yeah. there was no racialized form of uh, of reparation for that loss to them. And second of all, the precarity was not just racialized as well. In other words, the, the economic crisis of the non-Obama recovery was hitting working class and middle class whites as well. 
Right. And what happens is that the traditional paradigm that they had that class has gotten used to is that like, oh, black people are getting savaged by this system, but you know, white folks are doing well. So it always gave license to their racial grievance politics. But what happens now is that like white folk particularly college educated down with the mobile white folk were realizing that they're getting screwed over by capitalism also. And they're starting to say things like, hey, maybe this socialism thing is a good thing. Maybe Bernie Sanders is interesting. And because that class realizes that puts their racial ventriloquism in jeopardy. Right. And right. that is the, 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 the sounding alarm for them is to have black people turn to that politics. They go into full aggressive mode to kill that politics within black spaces. And that's what they did. Right. Oh, yeah. And I think that's absolutely right, man. And I would add, too, that that ironically, um, in light of the extent to which, you know, the nothing has changed trope dominates, you know, this kind of black, black political discourse, is um, that enough people, well-off black people, um, identified with Obama and his element and his program that I think that more more people imagined that, you know, not necessarily consciously, because this is as much an affective or like an emotional thing as, as, thing, as it is anything else, but, but imagined that the racial trickle down um, that was associated with the Obama presidency and it's penumbra, right? Like in the corporate world, but right, right elsewhere, was you know was going to trickle a little farther down than it did, right? Uh, but consistent with what Pascal just said, and and and, and uh, Jason's point about Los Angeles, that there's enough rich black people to absorb all the damn trickling, right? For <laughs> anybody who has to work for a living, right? Right. I mean, I've uh, when 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 uh, Darity um, calculated his what was it twelve trillion dollars right or whatever that new black people I I mean we got I figured by the time it got to me it'd probably be like forty six dollars and fifty cents on the <laughs> pound of hogshead cheese from uh, you know, the Italian market on the corner <laughs> which I don't even eat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, it's, I mean, it, it just demonstrates, right, that what we have is that the brokerage or clientage politics that mm -hmm. comes out of black power that manifests in the 70s with the right. first iteration of the post-civil rights black political class, who because of their need to contend with movement figures that still existed, at least had to surrender to the charade of redistribution agendas and give some right. fat back and biscuits. Right. Mayor Jackson did increase the black middle class with airport concessions. He did increase this, right. give some stuff to contractors. Right. And there was a little, you know, cheese, fat back cheese and biscuits given to, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, wealth redistribution programs. Well, but he also time. fired 2,200 almost all black sanitation workers for that's right he fired black sanitation workers in atlanta the home of mlk which is the man who went to memphis to fight the same thing happening in memphis and actually did the same action in the land of mlk which was but, but also though maynard when he was vice mayor you actually left city hall to go walk on a picket line with with the union that was that had earlier tried to organize sanitation workers so so it's not just that Maynard was a bad guy, right? Uh, but but there was like a structural thing going the on. Shift, the shift in politics. Right. And, he, and you know, he was the mayor of the black metropolis, the first black mayor of the black metropolis. Yeah, right. and, and that was that was a big undertaking. And I, and I feel like he kind of walks into uh, uh, an economic gold mine and a media shitstorm at the same time with the- Oh, that's uh, right. Look, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole time that he was mayor, um, the moth, God, uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, the whole time that he was mayor, um, the default setting of the local media uh, and opinion shaping um, people uh, or, uh, or uh, institutions was, was that he was anti-business. 
And like I don't oh know God, it's hilarious. what what more Maynard could have done except blow the entire Central Atlanta Progress board on Peachtree Street downtown at high noon and and boast about how good it tastes, right? I mean, <laughs> but, but see, at the same time, and like this is part of the you know bumpiness around racial transition. Before Maynard, um, like the Chamber of Commerce and CAP or Central Atlanta Progress, just just ran City Hall out of the cash drawer, right? I mean, they didn't bother to go down to meet with the mayor. I, I mean, they selected who the mayor was going to be, right? Yeah. Quite officially and explicitly, <laughs> and they uh, and they worked their policy stuff out uh, in the um, you know, at the. Piedmont Driving Club and Capital City Club or other places where I've had that sort. Maynard, being kind of old, old school black bourgeois type that he was, demanded that they come down and meet with him in the mayor's office because he's the damn mayor, right? <laughs> so on one level, you had to support him in that, right? I mean, you can't, right? Mm. But um, but like that just kind of is 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 an illustration of the poignance of of that bourgeois what well, a racial democracy moment too um but so yeah i mean um and i mean it, um yeah i've said this a number of places also I, I mean i thought thought i was really fortunate from an intellectual point of view to be in atlanta during all that transition right because i got to watch it all right um, andy young maynard and and was there throughout just about the totality of, of uh, Jackson's mayoralty, uh, and then saw a little bit of what came after. But but it's not just seeing the administration; it's also seeing how um, the racial transition in local government creates new and different kinds of constituencies mm -hmm. and social formations. I mean, like it's one of the most important lessons that I've got from reading not only you, but the coterie of black political scientists that have mm -hmm. echoed your understanding of black politics is that you've done something that you rarely get in the more liberal or even the one some more claiming to be radical analyses of black politics. You demonstrate that the black political class at its worst or best is always going to be a reflection of the condition of capitalism that exists in America at that time, particularly relegated to urban municipalities. And that, that the confines of that politics are something that constantly gets the hopes and aspirations of black movement activists or black you know people who want to exploit that racial politics crushed, angered, frustrated, or because they fail to realize that, listen, these cats can't work outside the confines of a system that's already designed to screw most of you over. Well, and yeah, and 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 one of the problems is that the radicals, you didn't have a clear enough analysis of what the system was in in the first place, right? Like I've but I've written this a couple of places too, but like it took me years uh, you know, to figure out that the problem with the radical black power critique was that it wouldn't let go of of an abstraction called the black community as the as as the normative subject right on behalf of which it launched the critique so the line was always well who really represents the black community and, and the problem with that was and i guess i have to duck when i say this there never was any such thing as the black community. Because part of the problem with the black community is you end up looking at black people as if they're 12 people sitting in a diner together. Right. No, that's right. Or say on a bus going to the march on, or uh, oh, I'm in the million closet. Million man. March. Oh, you didn't go? <laughs> man, look, you know what I did that day? Um, so, what? Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to out a brother here. But, but, but my good friend, Donnell Walton. Whom mm -hmm. I had met, right? So I mean, I met him when well, when I was up in Ann Arbor, and we'd got to know each other. And what I largely did on that day was just call back and forth with my boy down in Durham, who I've worked with since like I was in college, 
uh, and compare notes about bullshit we saw. Like at one moment, like my buddy called me and said, so, so, so did I miss something? But did Ben Chavis just declare Farrakhan God and, and himself, I don't know, God's gopher? But, but <laughs> Donnell began the day with an email and I was like locked in my apartment on South Shore about 10 blocks from Muhammad's mosque, right? Uh, but, um, but he sent me an email at the beginning of the day that said something like, so, so is it just me or is this the first time in history when people have called a protest march to protest against themselves? <laughs> <laughs> I've used that quote before. And I fell out. Man. <laughs> well, on that note, you know, we got to head to the champagne room. We are over an hour, so you guys oh, got okay. some bonus. Adolf, I do want to ask Adolf some questions about racial capitalism in the champagne room. More jokes are going to be had in the champagne room. If you guys <laughs> would like access to the champagne room, you can get access for a whole year for as cheap as $30. Patreon.com slash Bitter Lake Presents. The link is already up. Give us five, ten minutes. And thank you so much, Adolf, for, for coming on and, and hanging out with us. I do. There's more questions Pascal and I have we'd like to discuss with you. And uh, uh, Pascal, wait? yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I mean, how long should I wait? Um, oh, just just click when, when I when I play the music. Just go ahead and click the link. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Very good. Pascal, it's beautiful to see you back on the screen, brother. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Is, here, man. Man. Yep. Uh, so on that note, guys, we are out. We'll see you all in a little bit.